Good evening. I'm Marcia Hovey, the Emergency Services Coordinator for Santa Clara County Fire Department, serving the city of Cupertino. I want to welcome you to this evening's presentation. This is the fourth quarterly community preparedness presentation. So this, uh, there's no obligation, uh, just general information to help you be more prepared. And this presentation this evening, it's the topic is building safety assessments. Now this presentation is not a building inspection course. The city, after an earthquake, is required to inspect, carefully inspect with an official building inspector, every building in the city. And that could take up to two weeks. By the time we bring in those mutual aid building inspectors, it could take up to two weeks. All buildings. And so it takes a while. And so this is, a, this is not a building inspection class, but we do want you to make sure that you're safe in the meantime, which means that you do need to know what structural damage looks like. This presentation is an excerpt from the Community Emergency Response Team, also known as CERT training, that we offer in Cupertino. And so this presentation will be a review for anyone that has graduated from the CERT program. But you need to know this information too. This presentation is for everyone. And so this evening our speaker is Greg Castile and Greg is the chief building official for the city of Cupertino, has taught for our community emergency response team program for quite a long time and has a real passion for earthquakes. So uh, please welcome Greg Castile. I guess I do have a passion for earthquakes. It's, if you go to the certain websites, you can see how earthquakes, what they've done, how they react with different homes and such. And uh, it's amazing what nature can do and the power that they have. So as was mentioned, I'm the chief building official. I've been with the city for about 22 years. And I, 10 years before that, I had my own business construction company. And I worked for about five years before that for a heavy construction outfit. So it's been 30 some odd years that I've been involved with construction. I was only supposed to be with the city temporary. They needed somebody structurally to help. And here I am still. So it's a good city, very nice city small and a lot of nice people to work with. So it's very enjoyable. So in the audience now, how many people have gone through the CERT class? Ooh, a lot, very good. So you, guys, you should be up here then. Um, how many have had me do the presentation? Good, okay. Now I don't feel so bad. So you've never heard me, that's all right. How many are block leaders? Oh, great, okay. How many know a lot about construction? Uh-oh, come up here, up here? <laughs> you look familiar. Yeah, that face looks familiar. How many know just a little? Okay, none. <laughs> All right, that's good. So there's kind of a mix in here, and this isn't going to go into Engineering, I don't want to get too in depth and use terms that most will not understand. But we're going to go through the basics of what an earthquake will do, what to look for, and so that you can identify in your own home or if you're at work, what to look for that will provide you with safety. And some of you, I handed out this little thing on earthquakes. What you do in the USGS website, you can go to the latest earthquakes in California and Nevada and I took out the Nevada sites and I printed this up. So you can see in the last week, as of I think it was 8.30 this morning, how many earthquakes there were. So there were 479 in case you were wondering. Most of them are very small. The ones that are in bold, those are at least 3.0 3 or greater. And you know, you'll find certain areas that you would not wanna live is what this will point out a lot of. But it really shows the seismic activity that is around. And we may not feel some of these small ones. Yeah. 
Now, if you go to the magnitude, you've got the word map and then magnitude. If it was an 8.1, we would have felt that. Yeah, we would have known about that. Everybody know the size of earthquakes? Uh, eight point is a great quake. It works its way down. So eight is not a good thing. Seven, you get into a major quake and it starts going down. So a three, you're gonna feel, but uh, eight is not a, that's a, not a good one. So we try and avoid those if we can. We don't have a lot of say with that. Um, oh, there we go, that came off. These, <clears throat> excuse me, these slides that we have going on, Marsha, there she is, she's the one that really put these together and found the slides and they're, they're very good. She put this presentation together. I'm just gonna kind of look at them and follow along. So first off, we got the house. This is before the earthquake and you have the two screens here. So now you have the earthquake, 6.7, and you can see the damage. So maybe a fireplace. I think if you look before, where are you? Yeah, there was a fireplace up there. Standing up there, not braced too well. And now you got a big hole where that was, and things are looking okay. So what happens after an earthquake? Aftershocks. You remember the China earthquake that we had uh, months ago? The aftershocks, if you were to look at that, they were 5.0 or better, and they just kept coming. Those were the major ones after, and they just kept coming and coming. I was starting to document that for a while, because a five is a good size earthquake, especially for aftershock. So that being the case, after the aftershocks, yes. So the house may look okay, but with an aftershock, as you're gonna see some other slides in here, more damage can happen. Because uh, what you have is you have the shaking, and it's going to find a weak spot. And once it finds a weak spot, then it's going to overload. When that one fails, overloads the other areas, and then you get the domino effect. And as, you, as you're going to see, a lot of porches, um, overhangs and things, they might be nailed onto what's called a ledger. So they use a normal 16-penny nail. But by the time they get through the ledger, which is an inch and a half thick, you probably have an inch, and if you use a say a 16 penny green vinyl nail, which a lot of people use. They're three and a quarter inches long, so you have about inch and three quarters then going through the ledger, and it doesn't take a whole lot of uh, shaking, and that can come loose. So you'll see from the slides what can be happening. Now, different occupancies. Besides residential, on the top here, you have a school, and then you have a church down on the bottom and they have a capacity in case houses are destroyed or not habitable, there might be churches or schools that you would be able to go to and where we can have sheltering, because that'll be very important, especially in a large earthquake. So it's good to know in your community what's around, what's close to you, and so you'll know where you might be able to go if need be. Now, and sometimes you might be around someplace as a special hazard. So you notice the top picture, you have a tank could be full of chemicals. That wall could fall over, tank could move, whatever, there could be some leakage of that, so you wanna be careful with things like that. And looking overhead, you could have solar panels. Photovoltaic is a big thing that's coming on now. Very nice products, but when it comes to an earthquake, make sure that you look overhead. Power lines, what's up on the roof? It could be a satellite dish, you know, things like that. So make sure of where you walk, especially during that earthquake, and you could have aftershocks that can cause problems. Photovoltaic? Photovoltaic are, are what you use now to produce electricity. So you have, for a swimming pool, you might have solar panels up there that are full of water, so they'd be heavy also, and they could move around. They're, they're attached to the roof, but that's for water. The, Photovoltaic are used to take the sunlight and turn it into energy and bring it to your panel. Good products though. It's a good thing. They're just a little expensive right now. So when you look at this top picture, uh, you see the very front, it's called a parapet. And parapets are usually used on buildings to contain a fire to that building. And so typically the top 18 inches of the parapet is supposed to be fire resistant. As you see this, the bottom, the side picture over there, it doesn't look too fire resistant to me, but 
That's what they're made for, is to contain a fire. But now you have this huge parapet, they use it as a feature also, so they've extended it up, because a parapet only has to be approximately, oh, it could be 18 inches. That's what the, the fire resistance part of it has to be. So you have this big mass of, of brick, or this one is, is a brick, as you'll see what they'll do, what parapets, what can happen later in some slides. So types of construction in the Bay Area. You have wood frame, that's typically what all our residences are made of. Even multifamily, they might be on top of what's called a podium, which is a concrete garage and then a slab, and then they build wood frame on top of that. Uh, then you go to the high rise. We have a couple of buildings that are, they're steel, and we'll see some slides on that. And we have mid-rise, they too are usually done with steel and concrete, concrete floors and steel columns and structures. A tilt-up, we're gonna look at, those are, they pour the walls on the ground, they're made out of concrete, and then they lift them up and put them in place, and then they, they do columns around where the joints are. Usually, while on Bub Avenue, Banley, is where we have a lot of tilt-ups, and we have a brand new tilt-up going in off of Tantau. 10900 Tantau. T tilt ups were a big thing in the 70s. And they were six months, you can be done with the building. It was just in and out. Unreinforced masonry, we had one building before the uh, 89 quake, and it's no longer around. So uh, they are not permitted, and we do not have one. So here's kind of a layout of the three faults that we have that could affect really affect uh, Cupertino. The Hayward Fault is not here. That's up north a ways. But we have the Monta Vista Fault. That's probably our closest one going through town. Up past the dam is the Bear Call Fault. And then, the, of course, we've heard the San Andreas Fault. So those are the, the three main ones we have right in our locale. So the effects of cyclic reversals of ground acceleration and we're gonna show a little bit of that, but if you, let's see, I can't point it. They have a neat little thing up here. This building right there, it's setting this, no earthquake, setting just perfect. All the loads are coming down to the foundation like it's supposed to. Now, if you look at the second drawing, and you can see that there's a, there's stress coming across in those two areas, and if you look at the ground, See where that building is moved. So what it's done, it's accelerated over. So now the bottom of the, if the building was straight up and down, the bottom's moved this way. The top is still up here. It's not going any place yet. So now the top's gonna start swinging back and that's why you get this bending and, and deflection in here. So you're getting a lot of stress in that building. Now what's gonna happen is that earthquake, the top's moving over this way. Now the bottom's gonna move back this way and the top's gonna to be swinging that way, and so this is what you get going, is this swinging. And that's where buildings, now these look like tall buildings, but that happens on homes also. The ground starts accelerating, and it can move just a, a small, less than an inch, and it's moved more than 20 feet before. So it can really swing, so you can imagine a tall building, and Marsha has the neatest toy And this is, it's actually, it's a great little toy courtesy of the engineering department at San Jose State. They use this to teach their students about ground motion and the effect on buildings. So those of you that have seen this before, no, no fair sharing. But for the rest of you, let's say that these are three different height buildings in Cupertino. This is a single family, one story resident. This is a, maybe a three story building in Cupertino and then this would be our highest building, whatever that might be. Eight, story. Eight stories. Now, by a show of hands, which one do you think is the most safe to be in during an earthquake? How many think that the one-story building is? Okay, how many think that the two-story build or two or three-story building is? And how many think that that high-rise is the best place to be? All right, so let's watch what happens. You, If you Remember, if you've been through a, any number of earthquakes, you may notice that they don't always do the very same thing. 
And so they have different effects on buildings. Some earthquakes are very um, quick rattling. And if something that's a quick rattle, it affects buildings lower to the ground. And you, some, you may have seen the earthquakes that are slow rolling earthquakes. If you're outside, you see the street actually look like it's a wave. So let's do a slow rolling earthquake, which then affects the very tall buildings. And then some of them are a combination of both. So you're not safe anywhere. <laughs> On that positive note, so you can see how buildings move and you can, and this kind of, it shows buildings are designed a certain way and so that def deflection of the building, so when it starts bending like that, it's trying to catch up and how long it's gonna keep moving and the distance it's moving and that shaking of the ground, that's the problem. So it, it can cause the damage of the building. And again, once one member, structural member starts to fail, now it overloads the next two members next to it, which then they're overloaded, which overloads and overloads. And so buildings are not built to resist earthquakes. It's not cost effective to do that. It's very expensive. But they are designed so that they will sustain damage, but at least you can get out of the building. And it really depends on the cycle of, of how the, the waves hit. There's P waves and F waves with earthquakes and how they, they hit on a building. Because you can go to the mall, uh, Cupertino Village. During the 89 quake, you could go to one space and it was just a mess. The next space looked like nothing ever touched it. The next space was a mess. And so how it was cycling and going through, how the waves would go, how the shaking, the duration of time, all makes a difference on that. So here we have a picture of liquefaction. Now, what happens with liquefaction is the soil, it's like having sand with water. And if you were to shake it, it would compact down, but it doesn't have a solid base. It's not anything that you can, that you will support anything. It becomes like quicksand. And so it liquefies. And we have areas in Cupertino where this will happen. It could be sediment, gravel, sand, silt, areas like that. And it's the shaking of the ground, and that's what it'll cause. You might remember the Kobe earthquake. Uh, great pictures of that. On uh, how the, the soil is very similar to ours, and how liquefaction took place, and a lot of buildings did, failed because of that. So, and they did some other structural things to compensate for that, too. And they found some interesting things out that they'll do different next time. That's why when an earthquake comes, you try and find out what works, what doesn't. Houses perform very well. Wood does very well, by the way. So don't go away thinking, oh, what am I going to live in, a tent? Wood performs, it has good memory, and so it comes back and, and does well. Steel's a little different. Concrete's a little different. They still perform well, but homes do, do very well. So here you have a house, single family dwelling, and Wood frame, again, could be multi-residential, can be some commercial. Most commercial, usually they, they like metal studs and such. Easy, quick to put up. But you're gonna look, and metal frame studs have been used in residential, not as much, it's still wood. Uh, people like to use wood. So you look at this house, normal house, and you notice that there's a garage underneath the house. Do you know what that's called? Yeah, a hog. Hog, H-O-G, house over garage. So it's a hog. Usually that's about the only thing people are gonna remember is hog because it's a, they've never heard it before. So you have this house and you're gonna see some slides of what happens and the problems that can happen from that. So here you have the conventional Construction, wood frame, two-story house. This was in Cupertino, I was told tonight. I'm trying to figure out where that was. Seems close, but it was a small, actually it was a small house that uh, had a gas leak and exploded. So, uh, and it wasn't the owner's fault. And the owner wasn't in it, which was good. 
But if you take a look at the framing, well, first, if you go all the way to the ground, you're going to have the foundation. Then you see this dark little line. And I don't know if I can draw that small. No, I can't. Nope. Yeah, right there. That is the mud sill. So the mud sill on a house is bolted down. So it's bolted in the concrete. Then you have your floor joists and plywood. Now, plywood acts as a, as a diaphragm. It acts as a platform to keep a house from rotating around. And then you have your studs coming up the wall. And then again, you have your second story floor joists and such. And then your framing. And there's no roof on this yet. So you'll notice, too, that there's some metal little things right here. And those are hold downs, as we're going to see. So for a house to survive the best it can in an earthquake, it needs to be bolted to the foundation, and everything needs to be attached properly. And what you'll see with this next slide is a close-up of the hold downs. So what a hold down does is they'll put plywood on top of this. And what's that? That's going to keep a wall. When you have a wall, the, there's forces that go. That, remember, the forces are going this way. The ground's moving, accelerating and such. So if it's going to push the wall, you need something to hold it down, hold down. And they figure with the size of walls what size of hold downs you need to take. And you need so much dead load. So you, you can't just have it stuck in an itty bitty footing. It might take a larger footing because you need the weight for that to hold it so that it, it can do its job of overturning. So a house, if you go, that take me back? Yes. If you go back here, you can see some plywood walls coming into the middle there, and the outside will be plywooded. And these other ones with the hold downs, those areas are called shear walls. And so a shear wall, they'll figure in different directions on how, if an earthquake came this way, how it would react and keep the house from tipping over and collapsing. The same going the other way. And you might have interior shear walls. So you've got the bolting of the foundation. You work your way up. You've got the hold downs. Now you have plywood. The plywood connects to the mud sill, goes up to the second floor joist, goes up to the top plate. So it's all connected together. And that's going to work as your, your best seismic it's lateral loading. So what it does is it keeps your house from tipping this way. As you're going to see some slides where they didn't do so well. They didn't have hold downs, I would assume. They, how long have they been requiring hold downs in construction was the question. And California, it's been, 94 made a big difference, the 94 building code. Um, and so there's a lot of changes came in the 78 building code, um, 85, and then they structurally they changed a lot in 94. Uh, plywood shear was used back in the, when I was building in the 70s, late 70s. Uh, but hold downs weren't as much, some straps and things, but until they started realizing having earthquakes, how the structures react, they didn't know what to do. And so a lot of two-story houses do not have the shear. They have stucco, which would act as shear, and they figured sheetrock does. Sheetrock doesn't perform very well the second time around. Um, and so our city also has an ordinance that doesn't allow sheetrock shear because it's what happens when a, when a, if a house is moving and you have a, everybody knows what sheetrock is, right? Okay, good. You put a nail through it or a screw, it's going to sit there and the hole in that's going to enlarge. And, and so you don't have the shear capacity. You want something that's going to be solidly fixed that's going to keep you from moving. So plywood works very well. Sheetrock doesn't. So there are some provisions for using it. Uh, I've taken that out of ours. In, for our ordinance, we will not allow sheetrock to be used to shear. Plywood works the best. So, and they can find other means for doing that too. Used as well. Oh, I've seen. Yeah, you know, what is that? Press. Um, OSB board. Yeah, is that? And it's like different, you know, strengths, whatever. I've seen that on houses while they're being constructed. Is that, in like for sure, wall? Is that, is that reasonably good to use, or is that just them going on the cheap? It's used all the time. And it's used for roof, diaph uh, roof diaphragms, your sheeting. 
it's used for everything. It's, it's been out for quite a few years, and it performs very well from what they've seen. OSB board, oriented strand board is what it's called, it's OSB. And I'm still, I'm in the, you know, when you do, you used to build certain ways, I like plywood, but OSB works just fine. Uh, you get used to building certain ways and everybody uses OSB board now. So it's an approved product, has very good strength, and it performs just fine for building. And you'll see most houses, if you look at a brand new house, odds are they're going to have OSB board around on it. This picture here is of the garage. Now you might remember the picture we went back on that uh, when we first heard about the hog. So you think about a garage, for, for shear to work and for overturning and such, you have to have basically a four foot wall. And there's a thing called height to, to uh, width limitation. So you take a look at the garage wall, it's very narrow and yet it's tall. So if you were to have a very narrow thing, it doesn't take much to push it over. It's not gonna hold a whole lot. You have a bigger wall, it takes a lot more to push that wall over. But on a garage wall, you usually don't have the room to put a great big wall there. So there's these panels that have been tested. And there's a couple of manufacturers that make them and they do cyclic testing where they just sit there in this thing and keep going and going and going and uh, they have very high ratings. So those have been in for quite a while. We'll see how they do. Um, you never know until after an earthquake how new products are going to perform. You can test them all you want. They have very good values. And they are, the, the manufacturer of these are very, uh, there's two different type, like I said, and they do, they're very good manufacturers. Very good quality. Pardon me? Um, one is called a hardy frame and the other one is a Simpson strong wall. So, and I believe this is a hardy frame. I wasn't gonna get into the names of products, but those are the two that, I, that ring a bell with me that we see a lot. Yes, one is wood and one is a lot more metal to it. And usually what happens with something like this, there has to be engineering done and the engineer will figure out the values and what's needed to keep the, the needed to keep the displacement of the the garage. So what happens if you have, if you ever see a building and it has three sides to it, like a big open warehouse shed, what keeps that from going this way? So you have nothing holding this front together and that's what you have with a garage. What keeps it from going that way? And so usually you have your shear walls and in an earthquake things will tend to what's called rotate around and that's, they just can't take that rotation. So that's why they have these to try and keep it, so that's its shear wall. If you tried to use just plywood, it, you wouldn't have the capacity. It wouldn't work. You don't have the width to be able to nail it to do that. So the question is, what if you have cabinets on one portion of the wall? How do you brace it? So if you have a garage wall and you have a lot of cabinets on it, Oh, custom made. Oh, we throw the custom made in. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, if you can't get to your studs, it's going to be very difficult to do. You can. There are some ways that, such as with this garage, uh, instead of putting, if you have an existing garage, there are things you can probably put plywood on. It makes a stronger wall, but you have to make sure there's bolts. There's also something called a moment frame, which is a it's a metal frame that comes around and bolts down and so that can bolt on, doesn't take as much space and that performs pretty well. They use those even in commercial buildings. So if you add room on each side, you might be able to make a large moment frame. Otherwise, to strengthen a wall, you need the plywood to attach to the, the studs. You can get some good capacity if it's attached over the sheetrock, but not like going to the stud and then sheetrocking over. And in a garage, it's, not, it's nice to have the walls protected with the sheetrock. They work great in a fire. That's something people forget in an earthquake. Uh, the 1906 earthquake, a lot of damage, a lot of damage done by fire. So, and if you knew anybody during the 89 when their water heater fell over, uh, it's, uh, it can do some damage. So you, having nice sheetrock, getting that sealed like it's supposed to, 
uh, is is really a plus. And have and there's some, I have some information on how to bolt up your water heater and such. So we'll go through that at the end, um, what to look for for your own. But these little walls, garage walls are pretty tough. When you have a, a house, if the garage is in line with the house, it will perform better because it has some, some drag from the, the other side of the house. So on the top, when you have your studs, and you can see the, oh, maybe you can't. No, eh, not too well. There's a top plate. So you have your stud, and then there's two top plates on top. What that does is if, you, if there's plywood down this side, it can help contain this side of it. But if you have your house, your garage out in front, it's on its own, rotating. It can't use the house, so you can end up with a problem. Just, you know, irregular house. You have an L-shaped, and where your garage is, yeah, it's kind of on its own. It's not going to use the rest of the house. In line with the house, it stands a better chance. That makes sense. Okay. So here you have a steel frame construction, multi-story, and you can look at all the look at all the bracing. Now, a, a perfect brace is in a 45 degree angle. And so you look at these and they're in a, a nice crisscross pattern. So tall building, and when that thing's moving, you remember how th these little balls or blocks moved? So it's gonna help resist that and keep it from bending the way it shouldn't or too much. So you have that cross bracing all the way up so the loads will go in, go in, and they just, it just works really well. And a lot of times you'll see them on the outside. There's some other buildings in Cupertino, they put bracing, they changed their whole seismic bracing uh, to these, their, these special beams, and they perform very well. Uh, they can take the load and just keep taking it. And so, as you're gonna see, there's other buildings we have that are cross braced, and they, they do perform well. So here's parking garage at De Anza. You don't see a lot of cross bracing, but what you do have is concrete columns, a lot of steel inside the concrete columns. Concrete itself isn't very strong. Steel itself is not very strong. Steel and concrete, strong. So you have to, when you put steel inside of it, it makes just like a, it just makes a big beam. So you got a big column, and then you can notice there's some other beams, like right there, that go across the building. And odds are, and I believe if I'm, I can't see that well, but there's some little holes you see in the concrete there. What typically happens with those is they have what's called a, a PT slab. So they have these tenons, they're cables that stretch from one side to the other, and then they, they pull them tight. And they have different profiles that come, come through the building of what's going to work best for this. And so it looks like that that's, they have a, a post-tension slab there, which work very well. In fact, Seven Springs, I don't know if anybody lives out there, the, those are on slabs, and all those slabs are post-tension slabs. A drawback is if you drill through and you hit a cable, not a good thing, but they hold very well and keep the floor from cracking. Um, a little expensive, but they, they do perform well. The Kirsch Center in De Anza. What's interesting about this, well, it's a steel frame, but look at all the, the cross bracing that comes through here. Lots of bracing. You can see braces every which way. And that's really good. So if they can hide that bracing, and it's all been designed where it has to be anyway. But when you look at that, so you know that they've got that cross bracing, so it's gonna work. They've got it going every which way. And I don't know what the outside's clad with, but the structural steel itself, those are your primary members, seem to be very well braced. And then they have the concrete down below, and they, I'm sure they have some large footings that will take the loads and the uplift, because that building, remember, is gonna move. It's gonna wanna overturn. And so they'll have the proper bracing and the, the weight. You need a heavy weight to hold it from overturning, going each way. So I mentioned tilt-ups. Now tilt-up, you can see these panels, like right there. Those are poured on, a, on the ground and then they're picked up. They can weigh 30 tons, 60 tons, and so a lot of concrete. And what they do is they, they set them down, brace them, and then once they get the roof on, and it's, everybody knows what a glue lamb is? Okay, so you get glue lambs, 
they're just pieces pieces of wood that are glued together and, and the, in, the inner part of the glue lambs not the best wood top and bottom pretty good wood and some of them you'll see with big cam or arches on them and so when they get a lot of weight they can deflect down some they allow for that deflection so once they get the roof on and they plywood it then those walls hold together the problem with a tilt up is they have a, a big it's called a saddle that holds the glue lamb Oh, these don't have, well, they have little saddles. So the glue lamb goes into the tilt-up wall, and it holds it, and it's on the other side the same. So now in an earthquake, you figure 100 feet away what's going to happen with those walls, and they're heavy walls. So they're moving like this, and that's good if they move together. But if they decide they don't like each other and they move apart, what's going to happen? You get what's called a punch-out. And so now that, that saddle punches out, which overloads the other members and overloads and keeps going. So you never want to run outside on a tilt-up. Um, the panels coming down, you won't even, they won't even find you with those. So, and inside at least you have some members, and again, they're made to get people outside, so you would want to be away from the outside of one in, a, in an earthquake. And they do have a lot of good ties. A lot of the buildings on Bub and Banley have been retrofitted, by the way. So, and there's some very easy, not very costly things you can do that can keep the ceiling from coming all the way down. Um, I was amazed, amazed at what one engineer came up with, and it was, it was so simple, and I wished I would have thought of it. It was just, it's a wonderful way of doing it, and it provides the safety level that you need. So un, unreinforced masonry buildings. Um, probably nobody was there. But you can see the unreinforced block, um, bricks and such, how they come down, and what the damage they can do. So looking up in an earthquake, making sure of what's around you, real important. And you can see a lot of bricks came down, but some big chunks came down with it. So to identify unreinforced masonry in other cities, not in Cupertino, a lot of times they can chip through the uh, grout and it comes right out. Or you can see different courses. You can see these courses right here. And what they do is they put those in to hold the other courses together because there's nothing in there to hold them. So you might see that every six or eight feet. Uh, over windows, you might see header courses or soldier courses. Um, and so you can see these stuck out and they give, it looks like a nice trim, which it is. But the, be leery, it could be an unreinforced masonry building. So here you have an unreinforced masonry building that's been retrofitted. So what they do is they can take beams, could be steel or wood, and they drill holes through this, and then they put these plates, and the plates can be a foot around, and they have these bolts going through them. And as you can see, they come up the wall. Anybody seen a building like this? In Portland. Okay. Never been there. The. Oh, in Berkeley. Okay. There's one closer. San Jose? A restaurant? Aha. Spaghetti factory. Look at the outside of the building you'll see these things. So how does it perform? <laughs> it's approved, and there's ways of doing it. Uh, you know, if you look at the big stretch through there, and remember when we were looking at those buildings, how they buckle and bow? Uh, we'll see. Uh, there's some much better engineers that uh, have looked at those things and you know it's either tear the building down or try and find some way to retrofit it and this is what they've uh, found so again they find once an earthquakes come through they find out what works what doesn't work and they they alter from that the Northridge quake remember what they found out about freeways scary thing look at overpasses and the overlap on them 
they found that what they had for the minimum overlap wasn't good enough because they ended up moving across. So they can't just tear the bridge down and rebuild all bridges. So what they did, they've pinned it and put cables that are, so when it moves, it's gonna stop it. And again, we'll see how that works. Mother Nature can be very strong. So again, we have unreinforced masonry buildings. You can see where the sidewalk is and how it's just dropped off. Something to avoid, looking overhead. So when you assess damage on a structure, you gotta look at all sides of the structure. Again, look for overhead hazards. Could be on your residence, it could be your chimney, antennas, satellite dishes, panels. It could be your neighbor's chimney and such. So be aware of what's there. Look below grade, keep your nose going too for smelling for gas. Look for electrical that could be down. You could step on it and on an electrical line that's down, there was someone in Las Gatos that did that. Uh, and you will die from that. The odds are not very good of living. So really you have to watch the electrical, electrical in the house and other hazards that could be like that tank that we saw. So those that have taken the CERT class, why do they have their laundry out here? What is that? That's right. So those that have taken the CERT and they have their block, that's what you're supposed to do. If you haven't taken the CERT, you gotta take it before you can do that. That's what I was told. So what that is, is which is be very helpful it's not tagging. When the building department goes out, we have green, yellow, and red tags that we have to put on a building. And this is just letting that group know that it, this one is okay. And still a building inspector is gonna have to go through. So, but again, this is for the CERT group. Yeah, let me just clarify that. Um, I messed so up a little. The team, there are neighborhoods that are organized for earthquake preparedness. They have designated members of their neighborhood who are on response teams and they have earthquake drills and they practice together as a neighborhood. So within the neighborhood, that is the sign that everyone in that house is okay. They've checked their family, they've checked their house, and so then there are designated members of the neighborhood who quickly walk through it after the earthquake looking for houses that don't have white flags. And then those are the houses that they go back to first to make sure everything's okay. Uh, we only do that in organized neighborhoods because it would really confuse the fire department if there were just random white flags around the city. Um, and because there are aftershocks, we have to have a, a mechanism in place to recheck. And so in an organized neighborhood, they know that they need to go back and recheck. And so um, if, you, if you like that concept, we can talk to you about organizing your neighborhood. Now you know who teaches it, so. So light damage. It's really, it could be broken windows. Windows are not good to be around. Uh, remember the building flexes and it could spew glass really good. It just fires out there. So it could be tempered glass. Tempered glass just means that it, it's supposed to come down in little chars of stuff. But when it's blowing out at you, it can hurt. So be aware of broken glass, glass on the ground, plaster that's cracked. Um, as you can see, inside the, there's a lot of damage from things, superficial, but things in the grocery store that have been knocked out down. So it's okay to stay and clean it up as long as you've gone around the building, looked around to see that the building is safe. And we'll take a look at some things that'll show what you might look for and see. And then there's a little note down here for the CERT mission is to locate triage and prioritize removal of victims to designated treatment areas by the medical operation teams. So I can do that one, I can read that one. So moderate damage. You could have a large amount of cracking on the exterior plaster. It could be decorative work uh, such as, well, it could be anything. There could be mansards or uh, corbels out there. Uh, that could be damaged or falling off. And there might not be any outward signs of structural damage. So when you look at this house, really the house doesn't look bad, but that guy right there, 
So you've got a chimney that's broken right at the eave there, and it's leaning towards the neighbor. So it may not stay leaning towards the neighbor. What happens if you have an aftershock? It might start leaning the other way. It depends on how that house moves, or it might fall down. So not a place to walk, and don't just count on it falling off that way. It could be if the house is sound except for that, you might not want to occupy that part of the house. So be aware that just because it looks like it's falling that way doesn't mean it's going to stay falling that way. So you use extreme caution if you're on the inside and consider potential damage caused by the aftershock. The CERT mission for this would be to locate, stabilize, and immediately evacuate victims. Heavy damage. Could be partial or total collapse. The building could be off or leaning of the foundation, and there, there should be, usually is, obvious structural damage. So what you see here looks like it's a parking garage. Remember columns and steel? So if you can see the steel, not a good thing. And so you get that bending, and so it's balled off the concrete, and so the steel itself is going to bend and not do well. Have you ever taken a piece of metal, and you can move it back and forth, back and forth, and then it snaps? You, know, you can take a pair of pliers and take a heavy nail and do that. You can take steel, uh, half-inch steel, which they use in foundations. If you want to move it and bend it, it'll snap because it gets warm and it doesn't have the strength once you start bending it. The same can happen with this. Now, you notice with, with these, you have areas. Every column has a problem. And so what's on top of that? There could be a lot of weight load. And that's a problem with houses or parking garages. If you have a house with tile, the heavier the roof, the more movement it has and more it takes to hold that in place. And that's usually figured in for your house. So if you have a house that has, say, a comp roof on it, a composition roof, asphalt roof, and you changed it to a, a heavy mission tile, which looks really pretty, the difference in weight is enormous. And so the, the force is wanting to push that over. You have a lot more weight wanting to push it over. So Houses can be changed to support that. That's not a problem. But just be aware you can't just say, I've got a roof and I'm going to put this roof on it now. And when you look at something like this, you wouldn't want to enter that because obviously if there was an aftershock, that could go down with that. Yes. Does the city make sure that the... Um make sure that the house has been reinforced before they can put on the tile roof or not? They have to get a permit. Oh, they, yeah, they have to get a permit. They're supposed um, to get a permit. What, what we do is usually if it's getting up to about seven and a half pounds a foot, we start to question the loads that are on that. So you have a lot of products, a standard roof that's has a four and 12 pitch roof which would be a pretty standard house that's been framed. It can be older and such. They can hold up to about seven and a half, seven pounds, seven and a half pounds without much of a problem. After that, they would need to have someone look at it. And so okay. we'll have an evaluation done. So if you were going from, say, shake to tile, that would be much heavier? It depends on the tile. Okay. A, a, a shake, a wet shake, can, can weigh four and a half pounds a square foot. Comp can weigh, weigh about three pounds a square foot. Tile, a Mission S tile, can go up into the 16 pounds a square foot. Or you can get a lightweight tile that weighs three and a half pounds a foot. So it all depends on the tile that you go with and the type of roof covering. There's different types. Uh, the, the building code allows you to overlay roofs. City of Cupertino doesn't, but the building code does. Uh, we try and look for dry rot. That's the time if, if your roof's old, you're going to have some problems. And so we like to make sure that, that it's taken care of. So we want to tear off unless you can prove that the roof is fine. And so when you add on to that, if you, fig if you thought about putting two layers of composition, and the, the building code allows three layers, actually. Hmm. Uh, so you're getting up there in weight. And your rafters aren't made to, a standard rafter isn't made to hold that. So, and a lot of homes today are made with uh, trusses and back, 
back quite a ways were made with trusses and they, they can hold a substantial amount of weight. But then you have other problems with cutting those you have to be careful of. But there are, there are limits. So if you are putting, going from a, a shake to a tile and it's a, a clay tile roof, I would have an engineer evaluate the structure. Otherwise you're gonna end up with cracking and you're gonna end up with deflection of rafters and deflection of your ceiling joists and a few other things. Doors won't open. And hmm. so it's something to look at before you just do it. And that's okay. something we do, we will look at. If there's an engineer's report that says, tells us what they have to do, we will enforce that. Well, do all the roofers always get permits? Um, we get a lot of re-roofing permits. I can't say that all, re all roofers get permits. We have found some that didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, and they get in and out. And I, I, we have a very, our city provides a very good service for roofs. We, when you tear a roof off, you call us, we're out there within the hour. So there's no excuse for that you have to wait. And when you're putting plywood down, we'll be out there within the hour. So again, we want to encourage to get the permits and not slow the process down. Mm -hmm. And um, we're hoping everybody does. Okay. On a positive note. So again, heavy damage, do not enter. The CERT mission, secure the building perimeter and control access, shut off utilities, gather information from bystanders. So really, if you see something that's really that bad, sometimes people think, oh, you know, but I just got to go here. Or I got to go in just to get my car. Uh, the, those will be secured off in, to make sure that nobody can enter something like that. So a mobile home, we don't really have any mobile home parks in Cupertino. And, but you can start looking at the vertical and horizontal lines of this. So the carport's leaning, trailer's leaning, it's off its foundation, and so it's tipped. The one next to it, how do the vertical lines look? Yeah, not so good. So you wouldn't go in there. You know, so you're looking at the supports, and if they're like this, what are the other things? And you can see further in there, some of the walls are leaning. So anything that's leaning in an aftershock, who knows what's going to happen. So paint lines. So this is kind of an interesting question. You have a, looks like a door. You have a header up above, and now you've got lines that go off the cross. Is, it, is this a really bad, serious thing? What do you think? What's this? <laughs> so what you have to keep in mind is you have to look at everything around. If things are pretty straight and things aren't sagged down, the door opens and such, anytime you have an opening, there is no shear value in that opening. It's only the walls next to it. And you'll find doors and things will crack. How big is the crack? Do you see the thing hanging down and such? It could be just a crack in the paint. And that might be okay. You have to see w what else other things look like. If things are bowed out, as you will see a couple other slides, they're bowed out and you've got some cracks, yeah, that's not so good. But if everything looks straight and normal, doors open, you've got some cracks, yeah, there was some flexing going on. And typically, if you've got a header, it's not gonna crack like that. So perhaps they just have blocking up there that allowed it to crack. And there's not much wall to keep it from cracking. So you just have to take a look at each situation. So some large cracks at corners of windows and such. You can start again at an opening. When you think about how an earthquake's gonna take that wall and shift it, it's gonna crack, and it's probably gonna crack the glass, depending on where it's at and how the intensity of it, duration. And so you're gonna get some cracks that come down like this one. But when you look at cracks like this, you know, those aren't so good. And that would be kind of a scary That'd be scary. You would really want to avoid something like that. You wouldn't, I wouldn't go in it. No, not if it's like that. If it, and again, each situation, if I found one window that had a crack down like that, okay, it's got a crack. Windows crack, things crack. You'll see sometimes if you look in your 
the corner of your walls and things where they intersect with um, doors, okay. Yeah, you can start to get little cracks and that you get settling and depending on the soil, uh, there's certain cities that are very expansive. We have expansive soil. And what it does in the winter, it heaves a foundation up and so your doors might fit and then in the winter or the summer they dry out and their doors don't fit and a lot of things can happen. So you're gonna get cracking. This one here, that's a chunk coming out through there and it's actually bowed a little bit. So that's a little scary to me. Large cracks around doors, foundations, cracks above the front door, the garage door, cracks about one foot above the sidewalk at the foundation line. So when you look at that, I think there's a crack right about there. And then if you look in this area, does it look straight? No. Um, so yeah, it looks like you have a good support there and it's probably supporting part of the floor and this area is not very good. So with those cracks, that would be a real iffy thing if you would go in. You'd have to look at everything. But when you start seeing vertical things changing, that's when the questions should come up, especially on second story. So here's a page that Marsha put in. And these are rogue, well, she put in all of them. But for emergency information and reporting locations, so Basically, after an earthquake, you can go to the, a reporting location. But that's if you can't get through to 911 or 911 says to, that there's no help that they can send. So there's different locations, but they aren't automatically, they automatically do not have personnel there. They're volunteers. So the volunteers are gonna be looking at their own homes, looking at things, making sure everything is fine with their family and, and that then they're gonna be going to these different locations and you'd be able to go for some information. And again, they're staffed by volunteers in community emergency response team, CERT, right? Medical Reserve Corps. Do you have something you'd like to add on that? Okay. So 6.9 Los Gatos, 1989. How many went through the 89 earthquake, by the way? Oh, most, okay. Was that different to you than the others? Other earthquakes that we've had. Oh, you've been in those too. See, most of them I would it never bothered me. That one, when I was running to the backyard for my children, I was banging into the side of my house. I got my wife outside, and then I was running down to take care of that. And it was a little different. Normally, I I would calm her down. And what was that? <laughs> well, I was worried about my children. So I haven't been in the CERT class yet, so I can do that, I can run. So you think about the, what it did, and it was very short, and we we're very fortunate. Uh, we didn't sustain a lot of damage. A few deaths, a couple deaths, but not a lot. And chimneys, probably a couple water heaters. Infrastructure, everybody's, there's no lights running, and so that's a hard thing, so everybody's manners and politeness kind of go out the door, but um, it was different. And there are a lot of cities like Las Gatas, they had a lot more damage than we did. As you can see, the porch and such that was here, how it was ripped off. Remember what I said about the nailing? A lot of times on houses, you get this gingerbread or you get a, a big porch put on and it might be hooked into just a ledger. So they take a ledger's of one and a half by say five and a half, or it could be larger piece of wood nailed on but when you nail it with a 16 penny, and that's probably a, a standard framing nail, and a green vinyl, a uh, GV 16 is three and a quarter inches long. So you go through an inch and a half of wood that leaves you about an inch and three quarters. And if you're going through stucco, you got an inch of stucco, that gives you three quarters of an inch into some, some sort of wood, hopefully. So you can imagine the shaking and moving, it's not gonna take much to pull that nail out. So porches, if you think you're running out to the porch to be safe because you're outside and you don't want to go out, be careful. Or walking out to the porch, not running. Yeah. <laughs> so you'd want to be careful. Yes. Yes, it has. So again, you have that ground movement. 
and such. So you really have to, when you're walking around or even coming out, you have to look around, look at power lines. I have power lines right outside my house. Are they on the ground? Where are they? Do I even have a, a step to step out onto? What's there? You know, how does the door, what's in the way? What do I have when you go outside? What's overhead that you might have? Is there a lot of glass out there? So do you have a chimney right there? So really look around and be careful. There's never a dumb question. Can you step over a power line? I mean, if I saw, I mean. I wouldn't. Um, it, you know, you, I'd probably look for a different way if you can, because. The, no, don't do it because you have a voltage even as you walk. You will have a voltage between your feet. Yeah. No. It, You'd be surprised how much power is there and what it would do. And electricity is, is, can be very deadly. So that's why look for power lines. Look for your own electrical lines where you have them coming in. And just be aware. You have to really have your eyes open to all that. Now here's another building. As you can see, it looks like they might have a broken window there. Comp roof, not bad. Lightweight roof, but usually with big areas like this, uh, a lot of weight and a lot of a big area to move. Single story does very well. Two stories work good too. Single story just has less mass. Pardon me? Um, yes, I would certainly assume so because it looked pretty intact. So here you have a house. What, what do we have here? Yeah, well, you came up with the hog the first time. <laughs> That's right. So you had a hog, and it's no longer a hog. Um, it's down on the ground pretty much. So the garage is gone. You can see where it detached from the house. So the shaking and all that, how it's, how it's attached, and you have a lot more mass up in the air with not much holding it. And so it's going to go and fold and come across. So that's pretty typical. Remember I mentioned that you have overhangs and such? And so you can see where this was nailed up. And if you only have about that much nail sticking into things, you know, it might now some use lag, what's called a lag, a big screw and such, or there's other attachments. But again, you, you, if you think about a porch, you might have two poles, and then you've got this big structure on top of it. So it's going to want to do this, right? So it's going to want to rotate. And those poles are not going to hold it. And so it's going to eventually, when it rotates this way, it's going to pull the nails out, rotates this way, it's going to pull the nails out, and so odds are it's going to come down. So before you go running out, walking out of a door, you make sure, of, if you have a porch out there, take a look-see before you go walking out into it. Because they, unless they have walls and such, the, capa the shear capacity is not there. It's just going to rotate off. So go back to that one and ask, ask them, is it, can you go in that house? Is that, is that light damage or heavy damage? Are you OK going inside? Because remember that the structure but you're looking at the structure, not the things that were built against the structure. So look, vertical lines, horizontal lines. <laughs> screen door shifted, but I think the house is, looks okay. Yeah. It looks like the screen door kind of dropped. Um, may have. If you look at the structure itself, it looks like it's pretty well intact. The gingerbread and such on the outside is gone. Gingerbread doesn't make a, an unsafe structure to go into. You have to be careful how you go into, but it doesn't mean that the whole structure itself is unsafe. So here we have, yeah, a chimney fell. So the, 
the question, did every, well, the question is that sometimes a chimney can fall down through the house, and it can. I mean, you, you can see this here. And so it may not just set up on the roof. What do you do to help with that? And putting plywood up in the attic, it will, plywood is, or OSB board, is very strong. And what it'll do is it'll span across your, your ceiling joists, and then it will, so then it, it has a lot more capacity. So when something does come down, it may keep it from coming all the way down to hurt somebody. So when it's up there in like it is, I probably wouldn't get caught up in the attic with it. Um, beforehand, not a bad thing. After the fact, yeah, when's it going to fall in? When's the aftershock going to come when you're there? So beforehand, not a bad thing to do. Just be careful you don't, if you're going to nail plywood up, that there's no electrical or plumbing that you're going to cause problems with too. I would add that that depends on how big the chimney is. If it's a solid chimney, don't count on the plywood holding it. It would, it might, yes. If it's a large enough chimney, plywood spanning that, if the roof is holding it for now, it might hold it because you're going to have the roof and that. Structurally, it would be, if you had it there, I wouldn't say it's not going to come down, but the, you stand a much, much greater chance of it staying where it's supposed to and not coming through all the way to the floor and hurting somebody. Yeah, that's, we do a lot of things. I, when I was building, we did a, we put masses of concrete on top of plywood. And when you spread it over joists, it depends on what your ceiling joists are. Typically, they're, they're two foot on center. Some are 16 on center. Some could be 12 inches on center. The closer on center they are, the less span that the plywood has, so the stronger it is. The less it has to deflect. Two feet with uh, a good o OSB board or plywood, it'll perform. And those are setting, if you think about where it's setting, if it's mid-span out into, everybody know what mid-span is? Okay. If this is exterior walls or walls of that room and you put plywood here because your chimney's here, with that wood setting on top of that plate, there's a lot more strength than if it was outside or out in the middle of the, the room. Out in the middle, you're gonna have deflection of everything. But the closer it is to a wall, the, it's much, much, much stronger. So the capacity is much greater. Good idea still to do before the fact. How big is the chimney? Big. I just, how oh, big. So the, the largest plywood you can get is inch and an eighth, but that's a little overkill. Typically, um, if you think about a roof, roof plywood is half inch, and it's usually, if it's a plywood, it's a, a three ply. The center ply is not the greatest, and the two outside plies are great, are really good. There's also some that need better capacity. You go to a five ply, half inch. You can go. You can get different sizes. I can't really tell you a size. Uh, floors um, are usually three-quarter inch plywood. So if that gives you a, an idea. Um, and if it, I mean, certain floors, if it's a standard floor, if it's a girder floor, it's, they're, they're spanning four feet, and so you're inch and eighth plywood. But uh, that kind of gives you an idea. Uh, a five-ply roof is usually, they use on plywood on the roof. If there's a, a lot of, of need for capacity instead of your, your standard plywood. So. so if you already have plywood on your, on your roof, then do you also suggest putting the plywood on, your, on the ceiling joist like that? You, well, there's two thoughts with that. If you have, probably your roof has a half inch, it depends on your, what kind of, what, what's the pitch of your roof? What kind of house do you have? Uh, single story, uh, normal. A normal <laughs> yeah. pitched roof, it's not a flat roof. Inch, OSB or whatever the corresponding okay, so thing is. Pitched roof. Uh, plywood on a roof, 
your rafters are probably going to be two foot on center, and if it hit it, uh, it could deflect that. That your rafters aren't made for that, and the the span of that is would be pretty good. But you're on a pitch; it's hard to say. It, it's something as a safety measure to help with that would would be because let's say it hit the roof, it fell off. There was a there was a chimney that was reinforced, and the people refused to or they didn't want to brace it. And so when they added a second story on, they have a huge chimney that's stuck 20 feet up in the air. So I knew it was gonna fall. So that's where I went after the 89 earthquake and it didn't. Still stuck straight up in the air with no bracing, but it had great, the reinforcement, everything worked and the way that the earthquake came, it managed to stay there. So now let's say that fell off and it fell from a height, it could actually snap your rafters, which would go down to your ceiling joists and that's where you would be good to have the plywood underneath. So as a safety. And it wouldn't take a lot, you know, it doesn't mean you have plywood the whole attic area, just in that area, yeah. As part of the roofing permit, do you ask for different types of beds? As part of the roofing permit? Do we ask for which? Do you ask for the extra plywood to be put there in any other chimney? No. If, Why if, not? Well, the code doesn't require, you can still use skip sheeting, you can still use, skip sheeting is uh, where you have your rafters coming down and then they lay one by fours or one by sixes every other course. Actually, you lay them on, you lay your bottom course down and you lay them all up and nail every other board and pull those out. So it's kind of like a ladder to go up. And those work fine. They do not provide la as much lateral support. And most roofs, unless they're blocked at every joint, is not considered a shear wall. So they don't work as a shear wall, but plywood is better for this capacity than, say, uh, skip sheeting coming up. But if, depending on the roof that's going down, there isn't any way that I can enforce or, or force somebody to put plywood. If they're going to a composition, yes because there are certain manufacturers of roofing that will tell you what the substrate, ha which would be plywood or whatever, has to be. And so then we'd have to have that down. So, that makes sense? Okay. I'm limited, because I, I, sometimes I feel like I have all kinds of power, other times I don't, and, and I really have none. So it's the, the, the state tells us, the Building Standards Commission tells us what codes we have to adopt. And if we have to change anything, then I have to show climatically, geographically, and one other thing that we're different than any other city and have to have this. So otherwise we follow the code, and we're into new codes right now that were just adopted January of 08. And so our codes are fairly uniform throughout the United States. Um, there'll be some changes on the next code cycle, but uh, we're trying to get so it's a unified code that way, and I can't really say, you, I have to go by what I'm told to adopt, and the state tells us what to adopt. All right, what do you see there? So they kind of separated a little bit there. One of them's dropped down maybe a couple feet or one of them raised up a couple feet. A little bit of a problem, some nice cracks through here. You see some plaster or some bricks or something that have come off over here. Probably windows broken. Pool's not in good shape, but don't care about the pool, do we? What else do you see? Would you go into that? I heard a probably not. How about not? Yeah. Unless someone was screaming in, but uh, you gotta look around and see what's there. There's, what happens if you have a house like that and there's probably a staircase that goes up? Is the staircase detached from the wall? What's the floor look like? There was a, and depending on the area, we had an area that had a landslide where, and it was slow. And so it just pushed the house and just pushed it over a year, just really slow. So the inside of the house looked like a volcano had gone up. It was really neat. 
It was, it was just, I mean, it was bad for the owners, but it was just pushed up, the force that it had, and it just, and then the stairs were pulled off the wall, the doors were pushed forward, and it didn't just happen like that. It was just this gradual over a year. I, that was in the early 70s, I boarded the house up. So I was inside looking at it. It was amazing what would happen. So same thing with this. Look at the separation and what's there. Um, what's the inside? What's the supports like? It'd be hard to tell. It wouldn't be a thing you'd want to go into. So you go, you hear somebody in there, you go running on in. Yeah, probably wouldn't go in there. So you look at all the main supports for upstairs, and even some of the, right there, you've got some nice cracks, but all of these do not look good. So again, if you can see steel and concrete, not a good thing. If, this, if the concrete's broken off, if it breaks at, a, at an area like this, not good because that's had some big connections going on in through there. And so now you've got this leaning, and that would be a definite don't go in. Vertical horizontal lines? What do you think? Looks like the door's short. And you look at the, the building, it's, you can see the deflection right there, how it's bending? And you can see how this isn't straight coming down. So So when you have a chimney, and a chimney is you have a slab and then there's steel that goes from the slab up into, uh, this one doesn't show it, there's usually chimneys come up and there's what's called the shoulder and then you have the rest that comes up. And so there's reinforcement all up into that. A lot of chimneys for some reason people built and didn't want to put any steel up in them. And so we, we make sure that if you have to rebuild you go down till you find steel so you can attach into it. Because without the steel, concrete's nothing. And this isn't, this is, It'll just break off. And then at the roof lines, or in floor lines, you're going to have these straps that come around. And they're put into the, around the steel and such, and so they're to hold it into the, the building. And they go back a couple of rafters. And so you, you have this extra support to, to like, it's going to hold it on here. Eh, it's not holding it too well. And so now you've got, it looks like a little brace here. Yeah. So... I would be, now in an aftershock, what could happen to that? It might actually, let's say, you know, it could fall that way or in an aftershock, it might push it that way because it's still a tall structure, right? Or it might go sideways. It's hard to say because there's not a lot holding it right now. Odds are it's going to go down over in this way, but... You don't know. We showed that one slide of an aftershock, and the house didn't look real bad. Oh, yeah. See the foundation cracks there? So you start looking at a foot above. You're going to have your foundation coming up, and then what's it like once you hit the wood area? So if it's bolted down, yeah, you're not going to have as much cracking. If it's not bolted, you might have some good cracking. So here we have a big hog. A lot of garages with buildings over. And so without having wall, it's not going to do well in an earthquake. Not at all, because you have this huge mass up on top, and it's going to want to turn and twist and do everything with it, and it needs something really structurally sound down there. And so that's a definite, I won't even ask if you go in. <laughs> you don't. What about this? Yeah. Vertical horizontal lines, a lot of brick. Yeah. 
wouldn't be good. And that one, <laughs> next slide. So now, do you notice the, it looks like, that's kind of the foundation. So it's a little ways from it. And on hillsides, that's, that's a problem. And this looks wet. A wet hillside, it saturates, and then you have a, a chance for a slide. So you have to be careful with that. So he has gravity going against him with this house also. But the house is kind of, you know, it's still intact, just not where it's supposed to be. So we have a hog again. And anytime you have a big structure over a garage like that, and it looks like that was all garage, it's in an earthquake, they do not perform very well. So you notice the foundation, and the house should be there. Mud sill stayed, but the rest of it didn't. So what you want to look for on your own house is, is that there's bolts every four to six feet, somewhere in there. Used to be six feet was a standard. Some have changed to four feet now. Um, there might be plates instead, uh, instead of some were just round washers. Uh, today's code requires plates, so. But you can see how it moved off because the connections weren't there and it wasn't bolted. The, the, the mud sill works in, in what's called shear. So you have your, your foundation and then your mud sill on top and it's gonna be moving like this. And then the, the rest of the house is gonna be trying to overturn. And so when things are moving around, how do you keep it all together? And that's where plywood shear walls and things work, hold downs work, bolting your house to the foundation. My house wasn't bolted, and I bolted everything. And there's, if you can't get in to bolt it, uh, there's other plates and things that you can buy that companies make that go over and screw down into the plate or into the side, and then also bolt into the foundation. So there's some retrofitting that can be done. You have to know if it is bolted first. And that's easy, just go underneath your house and check. You can find the bolts pretty easy. Checked and tightened. Is there some regulation on how the bolts are checked and tightened? Mm -hmm. or is there guidelines you mean during that? construction? No, after construction. After? Yeah. Uh, they need to be tight. I know, but after like 20 years or 30 years, they, I'm sure they become loose, right? What happens is wood, usually the moisture comes out of the wood and they will become loose. Okay. And typically if you put a socket or a wrench and just tighten it, uh, you should, and just get it snugged down. There's really not a, like on a car, a torque. Uh, there are, sometimes on commercial buildings, there are some bolts that get torqued. They have a certain amount of torquing that has to be done. For foundations and such like that, just make sure they're tight, that you can't go in there and spin them off. Um, but wood will shrink. That's just its habit. It does, so. No, you aren't. You aren't moving. You're going from L.A. up to here. This is good. And again, houses perform very well. So in this house, the porch didn't perform very well, did it? So the gingerbread part of it, the rest of the house, you know, it looks like it's standing, doing okay, but the gingerbread around is very dangerous with that. So the steps don't go where they need to go anymore. So the house moved off the foundation, and you can see the gap here. And so going up the steps, and you can see the height that this right here must have been, because it must have had to go up into that area. So the house doesn't look bad. It's just, again, moved where it's not supposed to be. So gas pipes, electrical, all that can be a problem. Sewage, those pipes, are, I'm sure, are broken off. So, and then what's the floor and the inside look like? That's hard to say. But you got some nice straight lines here. It's just way off from where it is originally built. So structurally, it's not very good. What this doesn't say is there's supposed to be easy questions. <laughs> Do you have any questions? You've been asking some as you've been going, but. 
are mostly uh, 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 like wood construction with 16-inch uh, studs on center for the walls. Yes. How about post-beam construction? How about uh, what type? A post-beam construction where you have a, 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 like an open ceiling, like a open ceiling with a two by six uh, planks, a tongue and groove planks running okay. on there for the roof. So your studs and such will still be typically 16 inch on center. Some buildings are made with a lot of glass. Glass doesn't perform real well. And then the roofs themselves, uh, there's a lot of structures that have uh, four by six beams and they have two by six tongue and groove on top. And they usually have about anywhere from a two to three, three and 12. Everybody know what three and 12, four and 12 means? So for every foot, you're, if it's three and 12, you're up three inches. So from your plate at your wall, a foot over, you're up three inches. You know, two feet, you're six inches. So it's three and 12, four and 12. So a three and 12 is a, a low pitch roof, a two and 12 low pitch. Uh, and with those beams, the, the two by sixes span just fine. And a lot of what they found is they, a lot of the beams and such are at their capacity for span and you have to be careful of how you load them. If a, if a fireplace or a, a chimney were to fall on that, that would deflect pretty good. But the two by sixes have a lot of capacity too. But they're, a lot of the roofs don't have the two by six. They have what's, it's basically a, the beams with cardboard on top. They're two and a half inch thick cardboard that <coughs> was painted on one side and their tongue and groove. And they did those as very quick to do. And, they make a good insulation. Yeah, it's it's kind of a, I've only rebuilt a couple houses like that. They're probably yay thick, and it looks like it's cardboard, and it's made into these these sheets that are tongue and groove, and it was they're painted on the inside. So on the inside they were already done, and then you'd roof over them, and that was a standard building, and they perform well. They do okay, not like plywood and such. Uh, every Building, there's a lot of buildings, houses that have a lot of open glass, and, and the more glass you have, the less capacity of the structure you have. Um, and single story, most of them that I know of are single story. So, and California likes glass. They're really into glass. But you need wall space too. So having a roof like what you're describing, that's not a problem. It's, it's keeping the What's the, what are the walls and having enough big walls. If you have one big wall on each side of a building, you're pretty good. Um, and they, they work well. If you have a bunch of windows and itty bitty walls, that could be a problem. And that can be fixed, but it can be a problem. Well, has a lot of large windows. And plus, I don't think the studs are 16 inch. It's really strange. I don't think they're 16 inch on, on s s center. I think it actually has posts uh, that hold up the uh, the roof. I think it's called post beam construction. I think it was used maybe in the 50s and sometimes in the early 60s. Well, with, if um, it's out in that area, uh, there's a Rancho Rincon Rinconada has some some homes like you're describing. Uh, no, it's and, not in that area. Actually, the one I'm thinking of is actually in the Belmont area. Ah. <laughs> it's it's my it's, it's it's my daughter's house actually. Well, that area does really well with the windows and such. It's your daughter's. Um, yeah. yeah. What they, there are, there's a lot of houses like Eichler's and things like that that are built mm -hmm. right. that have a lot of glass. They have courtyards with, and it's all glass and uh, not very good for heat, uh, but they're really nice when the weather's nice. Uh, they're, and some people love the houses. So, but they are, a lot of times they will have posts, but they also have, blocking and such that come across that so that the windows are framed into that and they may be four foot on center because the posts are well some of those rafters are three foot it depends on who built the house that's not a that could be a challenge to seismically fit what they can do sometimes is they'll have shear walls that are made on the inside of a of a building so you can do that when you have, say you had your shear walls on the inside to go all the way up to the roof, and then it, it would take that 
rotation and, it would, and the strength to do that, you'd have to strap it and do some, a, a lot of other things with it. It could be done. Um, but some of the older houses, they never designed for seismic things. It just wasn't done. Right, right. Yeah, especially like in 1962. Yeah. Yeah. We have. The area between the mud seal and the floor is about 18 inches. Uh, should that be covered with plywood? The... Let me see what you're saying. So underneath your house... Yes, underneath okay. the house, there's a foundation and the mud sill. Right. And then there's about 18 inches of, of uh, wall. And then there's the, the floor, the okay. two by sixes and the, and the floor. Okay, so that's a different, uh, what normally happens, and well normally, one way of building a house is you have a foundation, mud sill, your floor joists sit on top of that, and you have to have 18 inches on, from the bottom of the floor joists to the dirt, earth one foot underneath girders and the girders hold the floor joists. If you have something on top of that and then your floor joists, that's called a cripple wall. Yes, and what that's happens, exactly what I have. Uh, cripple walls, what you have to be careful of is um, they can move and fold or they can have like what's, it could be called like a piano hinge and it can hinge in that area. So you have you have a mud sill and then you have this wall and then you've got your floor joists on top and so it could move this way or it can move this way. So plywood is a good thing to put on that. Okay, should it be completely covered with plywood? Yeah. Okay, and like half inch or three quarter inch? I really can't design anything. Typically what I see are half inch. So that's adequate? Okay. That's what I see a lot of people designing. Okay. Because uh, like Home Depot has the, the, the five, five ply or seven ply half inch plywood. Well, the, normally what people use is called CDX. And that's what I said. It has kind of a, when you look at it, it as a big yeah, thick center. I'm, I'm familiar with that, yes. And then you have two good sides and you don't. Yes. When you nail that up, you don't want to penetrate, drive the nail home into it and go through it okay. or through that, the, the outside because then you lose a lot of capacity of the okay. plywood. A five ply has a, a lot more sheets. When you think about it, if you just have two with kind of stuff in the middle, yeah. it's good ply and it's used all the time. A five ply, much more expensive, but you have, you have your exterior sheet, another sheet, a sheet, a sheet, and so yes. you have a lot more capacity with that. What you're looking at is to try and keep that wall from moving, uh, and hopefully you've got enough going this way to keep it from buckling out, a, a good attachment. But without anything to hold it this way, they're going to fold. Now, should you nail or screw it? Hmm. Screws are easier. Um, screws have, if you can use the same diameter as a nail, that would be okay. Sometimes screws can be more brittle than a yeah, nail. Some are very brittle, yes. Yeah, and again, when you think about a house, when you put that plywood on, and when it's starting to shake, and it's shaking, uh, what's it gonna do? Is it gonna break the head off of the screw? Uh, what's gonna happen with that? Nails too, the, the heads can break off just hammering them in, but they, they're more ductile than a screw. I like screws, by the way. Yes. I use them for a lot of things. I do too. Um, it's kind of, it wasn't required when your house was being built. Normally I see them do it with nails. Yeah, and this house was built in the 60s, mid 60s. Yeah. They wouldn't have had a requirement. Okay, So. thanks. Yeah. What about double pane glass? Is that better than the same thing? Does that give you any advantage? Glass is not, you don't figure glass in for structural anything. So you have an opening, you have an opening, and depending on how it bends, it may not function well. It's very good energy-wise, and it's required by the code now to have it. Oh yeah, so you have to have it. it the question was, do you, is, is double pane glass more structurally sound? And the answer is no. And if you have any more questions for Greg, you can email me at 
oes at cupertino.org, and I will forward them to him. He's happy to answer. He loves questions. And uh, thank you very much, Greg, for all that great information. If you could all thank Greg for it. Hopefully it made sense, right? Okay, good. Well, and the thing is that, you know, we live, excuse me, we live in earthquake country. And so this isn't, you know, we're not here to scare you. We're here to give you some more information so you can make good decisions. So after an earthquake or before an earthquake, you can decide. If you have a house that's full of glass, that's okay because earthquakes don't happen every day. But you better have a plan and some supplies and know what to do so that if you can't get back into your house until you do a little bit of rebuilding, that you're, you can do that, right? And those are, those are just our choices. So we have the information, we give it to you, and then you make good choices and we all get back to normal a lot faster. Where can you find, uh, we made some more, they're outside. Um, on the last page of that handout, there are four websites that have additional information. Um, and I have a couple of samples of the little booklets that you can get. One is um, from the Seismic Safety Commission and one is from the Office of Emergency Services of the state on um, home retrofit and seismic upgrades. Um, the, it gives you some sample costs of different types of retrofitting. Uh, re gives you recommendations if you need to uh, have an inspector or you want to have a consultation. It tells you the type of qualifications you should look for because not everyone understands structural retrofit and you want to make sure if you're going to do it, you better do it right. Uh, for those of you who have not been um, in our home and family preparedness class, it's a free three-hour training. Um, that information is also outside. If you want to pick that up on your way out, that's, uh, that will talk, tell you about the supplies and the other things that you can do to be prepared. And thank you very much for coming.